Well, it seems like we can finally tick transmutation of the elements off the scientific bucket list. Recent observations made by Bob Grainier of the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project provide us with groundbreaking new initial evidence of plasmoid or ball lightning phenomena occurring within the spheres of Malcolm Bendel's thunderstorm generator. This is a really big announcement, and I'm going to break down and summarize everything important that you need to know in this video. Special thanks to Bob himself for checking over my script for accuracy, and also to Steve Earl who provided some of the demonstration images that I've used here. Let's start at the beginning though. Bob persuaded Malcolm Bendel to cut a section of the 24-inch outer and 18-inch inner spheres from the 8-year-old thunderstorm generator that was fitted to the large Perkins grid-tied electric generator and several other large generators before this. And this unit had been run for around 500 hours on several large generators since it was first manufactured. And although Bob obviously did not have access to the original device, uh, it made a perfect sample for him to be able to observe the potential evidence of plasmoid action on the metal of the spheres due to the thunderstorm generator's operation uh, and look for evidence that may verify Malcolm Bendel's claims. Bob is one of the few experts in the field of ball lightning or plasmoids that operates in the open source domain. He's therefore one of the few people that can make sense of what we can observe under the SEM, the scanning electron microscope, and correlate the findings with the results of previous experiments involving plasmoids uh, to see if there's consistency. So we're very grateful to Bob for publishing his findings openly and even providing the full-length footage of his sessions looking at the sample live under the SEM. So I encourage you to hit the link I provided in the description if you can afford to donate to Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project and uh, support Bob's further research in this area. It's really important. You can check out Bob's published summaries of his findings on Substack, as well as the full-length footage of his sessions with the sample in the links in, on YouTube, and all of those links are in the description as well. Since I wrote this video, uh, Bob and Malcolm also announced the findings at the India Smart Tech Conference, and if you want to know more about Bob's take on his results, uh, along with a ton of references, seriously a lot, uh, I highly encourage you to go and check out um, this video in particular, which is on the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project channel. But this video is my own summary of Bob's findings during his live session uh, with the SCM. So I've taken notes on his full length sessions, which are over five hours, and condensed it all down into the most significant observations of structures potentially resulting from plasmoid phenomena, and some of the preliminary explanations Bob gives for each one. And in the previous videos covering Bob's observations of the macro photography of the spheres, we saw these polygonal pockmark structures all over the inside of the outside sphere and the outside of the inside sphere. And these markings themselves are highly suggestive of plasmoids. They're consistent uh, with the observations made by Matsumoto and his experiments with ball lightning, as well as the others uh, we mentioned in that previous video. And there are a lot of these spheres. Bob calculated that, assuming an even coverage, including the smaller structures at 5 micron apart, there may be up to 4 quadrillion 650 trillion uh, interaction sites over the whole surface of the inside of the outside sphere, which is a lot. So in these SEM EDS sessions, uh, Bob's goal was to see if he could find further evidence that supports the hypothesis that it is plasmoids in the system that were causing the transmutation of carbon into oxygen, as we've found on the gas analyzer results. And as predicted, he found plenty of evidence. The first thing that was observed immediately after he began analysis was an abundance of iron and oxygen-rich crenulated microspheres, and he calculated, assuming even coverage, there to be over 120 mil tw sorry, 129 million of these uh, dotted around the surface of the inside and the outside spheres. In Bob's view, these iron and oxygen-rich spheres are the magnetic cause of the active structures, the plasmoids themselves. The SEM point sample of the spheres confirms that these spheres consist primarily of oxygen and iron, with a smaller percentage of carbon at the ratios previously empirically observed in the hypothesized magnetic core of plasmoids, or ball lightning. Checking out the composition of the crystals we see behind the sphere, we find primarily iron, calcium, and sulfur. And the finding of sulfur-16 is significant because it can be synthesized from two oxygens, 8 plus 8. Bob already considers this, pending controls, conclusive evidence of the same coherent matter nuclear reactions driven by the fractal toroidal moment 
that he's observed in previous experiments. This iron and oxygen-rich sphere is considered the magnetic core of the plasmoid, observed in many previous experiments concerning them. And the crystal structures surrounding it, uh, composed primarily of calcium, sulfur, and iron, are also typically observed elements further suggestive of the proposed process. Bob analyzes a bunch more of these spheres, finding similar composition each time. On the analysis of the lower portion of one of the spheres, he finds nickel. And nickel's two places away from iron on the periodic table. So if we add a nucleus containing two protons, in other words, a helium nuclei, to iron, we have nickel, another suggestion of plasmoid synthesis. Next, he analyzes a broken sphere, confirming that the spheres are indeed hollow too, again as they typically have been found to be in previous experiments. Moving on, Bob spends significant time analyzing the so-called yin and yang structure that we see here. And once again, these yin and yang structures are features that are commonly observed in previous plasmoid experiments, and he finds a number of them in this initial session. And you can check out the references to these experiments provided in Bob's summary, and I'll link to a number of them in the description as well. The lighter side is the yang side, and this is the destruction zone where matter is being torn apart and the sphere is being cleaned off. In the base material, we find iron, chrome, and nickel in ratios typical to the stainless steel used to construct the sphere. And the latter element could also explain the nickel that we found earlier. It could be a cause. The darker side of the yin side, um, this is where the electronuclear regeneration occurs. And we see a hard line between the two sides. And we find many small spheres in the yin area, where the material is being constructed. He doesn't just find iron-rich spheres here, but also silicon and aluminium-rich spheres. He also finds uh, calcium co-located with sulfur, which is again typical of plasmoid synthesis. We find calcium and sulfur co-located again in this bloom-like structure. Bob hypothesizes that the calcium and sulfur may be synthesized by the plasmoid. So two oxygens, 16, fused to synthesize sulfur, 32. Sulfur-32 plus carbon-12 fused to synthesize calcium-40 and helium-4. The helium is lost in the reaction, uh, or three may fuse together to create another reaction. And please note that the images uh, that I've got here just show the proton count of the elements for the simplicity of demonstrating the maths of what's happening. The actual isotopes involved in the reaction will be carbon-12, sulfur-32, etc., like I've been saying. Going back to the image of this yin and yang structure that we looked at before, Bob checks out the composition of this area that's selected over to the side, and he finds titanium, uh, something else that he'd set out to look for. According to Matsumoto, titanium is an electronuclear regeneration product of electronuclear collapse. So it's synthesized by fusing isotopes of oxygen and carbon in the ratio of CO2. We find 6.09% by atomic concentration and 6.82% uh, by weight uh, in this sample. And that's a significant finding which will be explored more deeply in the future uh, with further testing and controls. Bob checks out an interesting blob, uh, primarily carbon and oxygen, but this time with the addition of magnesium and silicon, which are co-located and spread around the blob. And we also find high levels of calcium, suggesting fusion from sulfur and carbon, as we found earlier. The magnesium and the silicon are the other elements uh, that we find that are frequently, frequently synthesized by plasmoids, again based on the data Bob has gathered from previous experiments. So oxygen 8 plus carbon 6 equals silicon 14, carbon 12 plus silicon 28 equals calcium 40, and then we have carbon-12 plus carbon-12 equals magnesium-24, and oxygen-16 and magnesium-24 equals calcium-40. And within the darker areas of one part of the sample, Bob finds areas riddled with these worm-like paths with nanospheres spaced fairly evenly within them. He mentions that this is reminiscent of the EVOs chopping through the diamond and silicon dioxide in the late uh, Neil Crichton Gould's Lion reactors, uh, which in the latter case left little crystals behind in the resulting gap. Last but not least, from these sessions on the inside of the outside sphere, we see these beautiful crystal structures all over the place. And these are primarily composed of sulfur, calcium, and oxygen, uh, as we found in some of the other structures we discussed earlier. There are microspheres riddled throughout the crystal structures once again, 
And it's important to note that they're seen atop the crystals, at, at the end of the crystal either, at the end of the crystal. And it's this kind of phenomena that can tell the story of the plasmoid's journey, so to speak. And so we should see deeper investigation into many of these structures in future analysis uh, so we can build an even deeper picture of what's occurring. Bob mentions these crystals look just like uh, the ones in the center of the flux loop in the magnetohydrodynamic structure in a Lion reactor experiment referenced earlier, uh, which we composed of calcium, carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen. He proposes that this is the result of a larger plasmoid hitting the sphere and collapsing into many smaller plasmoids, which are also collapsing. It breaks up into small fragments and deposits these large crystals with either an iron-rich crenelated sphere or a glassy amorphous carbon sphere at the end of each channel. And we have the synthesis of oxygen, sulfur, and calcium from CO2, as we discussed earlier. So Bob concludes his analysis of the inside of the outside sphere by saying that he's sure of the results he's seen here. This is involving ball lining or plasmoid phenomena. These are all the signatures of the fractal toroidal process, consistent with the spectrum of ball lining synthesis that can be found on Wikipedia and consistent with the signatures that Bob has identified over his six years of research into ball lighting phenomena. This is evidence of transmutation. The outside of the inner sphere also confirms this. Here Bob finds a whole bunch more iron crenelated spheres as expected. They're much dirtier than the spheres found on the inside of the outer sphere, and we see a lot of elements mixed together in this area. These spheres are mostly just consist of iron, chromium, oxygen, uh, with a fair chunk of nickel and some silicon, manganese, and chrome. So the elemental content of the steel of the sphere, in other words, which should suggest that the uh, plasmoids may be ripping up the steel a bit here and pulling it into their core. Not all the spheres are so dirty, though, and he finds some beautifully crenelated specimens on this sample as well. And there are also a number of these silicon and carbon rods to be found, similar to what has been observed in Matsumoto's experiments. The lighter rod is composed of silicon, calcium, aluminium, and magnesium, and the darker rod is primarily carbon. We see carbon, oxygen, and a small amount of nitrogen. Bob notes that these rods were seen in the optical microscopy, microscopy uh, before the section of the sphere was cut. Uh, however, it must be noted that the Dremel cutting discs also do contain glass fibers. And since in some cases they're um, torn steel fragments near these rods, it may be that in some cases the fragments are from the cutting disc. Uh, but it seems unlikely that all of them are, as he observed them before the spheres were cut. So next we find a ball with a tail on it, similar to the structures that were found by the Swiss oxyhydrogen researcher Slobodan Stankovic uh, in his HHO experiments. So you can see that Bob managed to quite easily find an immense amount of evidence suggesting plasmoid phenomena, which is consistent with the prior experiments in the field during his sessions with the samples from the thunderstorm generator. So further trials and repeat analysis will need to be performed in future for due diligence, and we look forward to seeing this happen, but the microscope isn't lying here. Uh, there are a number of signs suggesting that this could only really be the work of plasmoids. So to conclude, I just wanted to show one last strange image from the SEM session. When Bob was checking out uh, one of these iron-rich crenelated spheres, this little guy was sitting nearby and people were joking in the video chat that it looked like some kind of sea slug. But then later when I spoke to Malcolm and uh, Kian on the phone, they sent me this image of an old conceptual drawing of Solomon's Shamir plasmoid. So I'll just leave you with that one. It's interesting. So that's all for this update. Uh, we've got evidence of transmutation. It's a huge development. Significant results from Bob Grainier of the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project and Malcolm Bendel. So congratulations, Malcolm, uh, on your claims for the Thunderstorm Generator being further verified yet again and in a really, really big way. And of course, congratulations to Bob as well for making the findings. So please remember to reach out and donate to the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project so you can enable Bob to carry on with more important work like this. Um, there are very few people doing this open source, so it's really, truly an invaluable service. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned for plenty more on this topic. Obviously, I'm going to keep covering this thing. It's very interesting. We have transmutation. Catch us next time.